Hey friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm back with the second video in our 2023 Three Rivers Challenge series. This is where I'm showing you all of the meals that we're making through our pantry challenge that we do every year in the months of January and February. And so as I mentioned in last week's video, which I'll link in the description if you haven't checked that out yet, um, I'm only sharing meals that are new. If they're duplicates from last week, I will be skipping those meals. So that's why some of those will not be included um, in this meal or in this video. Um, but all right, let's go ahead and get to it. This is what we ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner this week on the pantry challenge. Okay, so Saturday night we're doing some food prep. I have lots of empty jars here that I'm trying to refill, so I have some beans soaking. I've done a whole video on canning dried beans before, and I'll link that in the description if you want to learn about that process. But I soak all of my grains and beans and things. I have Sunday night's beans for dinner, also soaking overnight, and then I have our oats for Sunday morning breakfast soaking with just a little bit of apple cider vinegar in with them. This makes them easier to digest and breaks down the phytic acid to make the nutrients more bioavailable. Here's what those oats look like after soaking overnight. We're gonna drain out the soaking water and then refill with clean water to uh, make our breakfast this morning. I also added a little bit of sugar and since this is just basically a lot of carbohydrates and sugar there, we're gonna add a can of organic coconut cream. This will add some fat, um, a couple other nutrients, as a little bit of protein. You can see the um, iron in there, a little bit of potassium and things. So it just makes it a little more nutritious than if I was just giving them the oats with the sugar. And so that is what we are having for breakfast. I also decided to make some juice. We're taking some home canned cranberry juice. We also have some home canned Concord grape juice, and I like to mix these together. The cranberry juice is pretty tart. The grape juice is a little sweeter, and so they sort of balance each other out. And I'm putting this in a half gallon jar and straining out the fruit that's left behind. You could reuse that fruit, make a jam or something like that. We're just on this day gonna feed it to the chickens and they will turn it into eggs for us. Um, I decided to add another jar of cranberry juice. So for this juice, we have two jars of cranberry and one jar of Concord grape. Just mix that together and that'll be a little extra nutrition for breakfast for the children. There's Gracie coming in from her chicken chores. She's got the bowl there. That's what we feed all of those food scraps to the chickens in. And every day, sometimes twice a day, they take that out. So those um, berries and things will definitely not go to waste. Our oatmeal is thickening up. I always have to make a little separate pot. I pulled some of it out before I added the coconut cream because coconut, um, Adam does not like the taste of coconut. So we have that for Adam. I also put a couple eggs in some bacon grease here for both Adam and myself so that we could have that for breakfast. We've got our wonderful juice here full of good nutrition for the kids. And then they've got their oatmeal. And this is what we had for breakfast on this Sunday. Just super easy. I like to keep breakfast pretty simple on Sunday mornings because we have to... Um, get ready for our church and things like that. And I typically like to sleep in a little bit on Sunday. So just something really easy to feed the family. Gabe's portioning out our juice amongst the children's cups. You can see I use those different colored bands to tell whose cup is whose. That's really helpful for us. A lot of the children like to have some kind of frozen fruit over the top of their oatmeal. On this day, I just grabbed some frozen blueberries um, that we preserved last uh, June or July, and we just sprinkle some of those on top of the hot oatmeal, and they kind of thaw immediately for the children. Just something simple, and it filled bellies and warmed everybody up on this cold Sunday morning. Immediately after breakfast, I started thinking about dinner. So I had these pinto beans soaking overnight. We have an onion here, and we have some leftover ham and the ham bone from the previous Friday night's dinner. I made that in last week's video. So we're just gonna get this onion sliced up and stick it in the bottom of a pot. We're gonna add our ham bone 
And we are also gonna slice up any of the leftover ham from that meal. And we're just gonna make some ham and beans, just a simple, hearty dinner on this Sunday. It can slow cook on the stove all day. We drained those beans. We're gonna add those to the pot. Pinto beans are all I had in storage, so that's what I'm using. Typically, I use like white, great northern beans or white navy beans, whatever they are, <laughs> instead in my ham and beans. But since we have pintos to use up, that's what we're using on this day. I'm gonna also add some bay leaves. This is freeze-dried celery from last year's garden. We're just gonna toss some of that in. Also some freeze-dried parsley from the garden, and that will just add some extra flavor to our delicious ham and beans here. I have tons of garlic up here. I've been terrible about using it. I've been using my garlic powder and things instead because I'm too lazy to peel garlic. So I need to get the children busy helping me peel all of that and get it preserved into something before it starts to go bad. We're also going to peel this garlic and get that in the pot with the rest of these ingredients. And then as I mentioned, that will simmer all day while we get to our other tasks, which right now we need to grind grains for the week. This is one of my goals for the week is to grind through whole grains. We have some blue corn. We also have buckwheat groats. These are roasted buckwheat groats. And we're just going to um, grind them into a, a flour. This is what the blue corn looks like when it grinds down. I use a Nutramil here and I do not love my Nutramil. As you can see, I have to put a towel over the canister. It spits flour all over my kitchen when it's milling grains. So I definitely do not recommend this model. There we've got the buckwheat going down into the grinder and then it shoots it out into that canister as flour. I had the old uh, version of the Nutramil and I really loved it, but we broke that motor by accidentally putting frozen grain in it. And so unfortunately I dislike this newer model very much. So I would not recommend it but we, it gets the job done. We have our flour here, there's our blue corn, and then there is our buckwheat flour. We're gonna use these in some of our meals this week, so I just wanted to get that done while I had time on this Sunday afternoon. Other grains that I really need to focus on using up include um, wheat berries, we've got oat groats, lots of things like that um, that we need to make flour out of, but the blue corn flour is going to make our cornbread for the ham and beans for dinner. So I will post this recipe in the description, but I'm gonna use a gluten-free uh, flour for the wheat portion of this recipe because I want to eat it. We're gonna use water glassed eggs here, and as you can see, they look perfect when they come out of storage. And we're gonna make a beautiful cornbread. There it is, just testing the middle to make sure it's done. And as I mentioned, I will leave this recipe in the description. I love blue corn cornbread. It's just something different to make and it's very pretty. The children like to eat it. We have lots of that leftover ham and beans that was cooking all day. So that will make a leftover meal for the next day. And then I made some homemade lemonade to go with the dinner. Um, just filling bellies here. We also like to drizzle maple syrup over our cornbread ham and beans. I'll show you what that looks like when we get it all put together here. So we cut a slice of cornbread, we pour a scoop of ham and beans over the top, and then we drizzle a little bit of maple syrup to add some sweetness, and it's just the perfect touch on top of you know, that meal, very tasty. Um, this is Adam's family has always made it this way, and I was kind of hesitant when I met him. I thought it was weird to put maple syrup on top of the beans, but I trust me, it is delicious. We really enjoy it. Something else I always do on Sunday nights is my meal planning. You can see there I have a list of all the things that I wanted to use up from storage, and then I have an empty planner, and I'm just going to make a meal plan from all of that. And this is what we came up with for this week. Um, I will leave a link to my planner um, in the description. This is a must when you're doing a pantry challenge is to do some meal planning so that you're organized because you're cooking three meals a day. You have to have a plan. <laughs> All right. And so the last task for Sunday night is to finish canning these beans that had been soaking overnight. You can see they swell quite a bit. By the end of the night, we had them all canned up. Once again, you can find a tutorial on that in a different video, but 
Just trying to refill the pantry shelves a little bit as we empty things. Moving on to Monday morning's breakfast, we're going to use carrot souff we're going to make carrot souffle and speaking of using up jars, this is my favorite way to use canned carrots. As you know, canned carrots kind of have a distinct flavor. It's very different from a fresh carrot. And so I like to turn them into souffle. I'm draining out the carrot broth from the jars and we will just add that to the next soup we make so that the nutrients in that aren't wasted. Um, why not use it to cook rice or to make a soup or something like that? Otherwise, all of that is just gonna go to waste if you pour it down the drain. So we are going to take our softened cooked carrots here. The canning process cooked it for us. So all we have to do is kind of mix them together and make it into a puree. And once we get that all mashed down, we added all the rest of our ingredients and we're gonna get our souffle in the oven baking while we go about all the rest of our morning tasks. This is what that looks like putting it in our baking dish, our very well-loved, well-used <laughs> baking dish, obviously. Um, while that's baking, I've got the girls here labeling our beans that sat out overnight, and we tested all of our seals, and they were all good and ready to be put on the pantry shelves. And then I also cooked up some toast while we are waiting on the carrot souffle, just enjoying some morning snuggles, while breakfast bakes. Once it came out of the oven, uh, the kids wanted to add some powdered sugar to the top of it. So I said, of course, you can go ahead and do that. And you can basically put any topping on this that you would like. You could make a glaze, you could just eat it plain. There we've got our toast and I grabbed just several jams and jellies and fruit butters and things that we had in the fridge that need to be used up. There is our carrot souffle. I'm going to go, go ahead and cut a piece so you can see what the texture of this turns out. So it's definitely kind of custardy, souffle-like on the inside. Very delicious. And as I mentioned, you know, canned carrots, some people don't prefer the taste of them raw. So a really great way to use them up is to put them in some kind of um, baking recipe like this where you can kind of sweeten them or hide the flavor of them but still get the nutritional benefit. So that's what I am doing here. And that is what the kids had for their breakfast. We took it very easy for lunch. I just grabbed the leftover ham and beans from the night before and then that jar of carrot broth that we had from breakfast. And we just kind of mixed that together and made a little bit of a ham and bean soup. Um, just something simple on this day because we were very busy doing school and we kind of ran behind and I was scrambling to come up with something and we did this wasn't our planned meal but I just decided to do this instead because it would be easy. I pulled out some pie crusts from the freezer for dinner and on this day we are going to make a chicken pot pie and thankfully as I mentioned it was a very busy day so I was grateful to have the pie crusts all done. I also have the uh, pot pie filling done. I can this base. It's like a chicken pot pie base. In the last video, I used it to make a chicken soup kind of thing. On this day, we're going to turn it into pot pie filling. All you need to do in order to do that is heat it up and add your thickener to it. I'm adding arrowroot powder. You could add flour, cornstarch, whatever it is that you use to make your gravy. And so that will thicken that up. We are putting our crusts on there and we ended up making probably the ugliest chicken pot pie I've ever made. <laughs> it's not pretty, but as I always say, it'll fill bellies. I also added some pear sauce with cinnamon and warmed that up. And so the kids could have some chicken pot pie and a little bit of pear sauce for their dinner. And they actually really enjoyed this, even though it was really ugly to look at. Look at that. <laughs> but everybody got their own little half pint jar of the fruit sauce and it got the job done for dinner on this day. We're gonna use up that buckwheat flour that we ground over the weekend to make buckwheat waffles. It's a great gluten-free option, so I will share this recipe in the description. We're gonna use gluten-free flour. Here is our baking powder. I actually bought this huge five pound or four pound, I guess, tub four months ago and we're almost through it. I'm hoping it lasts the rest of the challenge. 
and just getting all of my dry ingredients for the waffles ready first. And then after that, we start adding our wet ingredients, a little bit of vanilla, some eggs. We added some um, cashew milk, I believe. We're just gonna get that mixed up while the baby sleeps. Majority of the time I make regular wheat waffles for the children in the morning, but every once in a while, if I had the foresight to grind up some buckwheat flour, I enjoy eating these for breakfast. We're gonna make blueberry syrup out of a pint of canned blueberries. And I also decided to make some whipped coconut cream on this day. I bought this new whipped cream dispenser. Um, I was influenced by a friend. You just do coconut cream and powdered sugar and mix that together. And then this dispenser um, will create a whipped cream for you. And as someone who can't, a, a dairy-free family who can't have reg regular whipped cream, this is a huge treat for us. So we've been experimenting with this. We finally figured out how to get it to whip up nicely and it's working great. So I can also, once again, anything I show here will be linked in the description if you're interested in that. And I just made a nice little topping on our waffles on this day. So we have our buckwheat waffle. I added a little bit of the hot blueberry syrup there, and then we'll just put a little bit of coconut cream on top. Nice treat on this morning. Most of the kids, the older kids, will eat two to three waffles in a sitting, so we have to make quite a few <laughs> to feed this army of children. And of course, all the leftover whipped cream didn't go to waste. There were plenty of kids willing to <laughs> eat it plain after the meal was done. So, fun breakfast, and it was a slower morning, so we had time to make something that took a little extra time on that day. Got children to entertain Hannah for me so I can get the job done, and it all works out wonderfully. And then on that day, David was deciding to get some pizza dough ready for me for lunch. That was such a help that he did that earlier in the day. While he's doing that, I'm getting dinner started. I have a rump roast, and I'm going to pour a jar of my canned corn relish. This was just a pint of corn relish. I canned this back in August for you guys, so you can find that um, in some of the videos from August. It just has celery, cabbage, onion, corn, and it's like a sweet vinegar base. It's very delicious. It's good as a dip. And then I grabbed some apples out of storage to have as snacks. These apples are cameo apples. They're my favorite storage variety. We got these from Adam's Grandpa's Orchard back in October, and we keep them in our overflow fridge in our garage on... Um, just a, a temperature of like 34 degrees, and they stay perfectly crisp through the winter for us that way. It's a huge blessing. You can see we have a couple different varieties here. And if they do end up starting to go soft toward the, the beginning of spring, we just turn them into applesauce and can them. But this is the fresh fruit that gets us through a lot of the winter so that the kids have, you know, something raw and fresh to munch on. And then we can also bake with them and make um, fresh apple pies or apple crisps or cobblers and things like that. So huge blessing to have those in storage. While dinner is baking or cooking in the crock pot, getting some school done here, everybody's busy. This is what most of our days look like between breakfast and lunch, just trying to hit the books and get it all done. And then as soon as I'm done working with the little ones, the older children continue their studies, and I try to work on lunch and entertaining these little guys. So that's what keeps me busy most days. Speaking of lunch, David's dough that he made after breakfast had risen and was beautiful. This is our pizza dough that we use. I had pulled some tomato paste that we made from our tomatoes this fall, pulled it out of the freezer, and it's been thawing. I use tomato paste, olive oil, oregano, salt, and garlic powder to make my uh, pizza sauce. And so now that that's thawed, I can get that made. We've got some sauce right here then that we're gonna use. We have freeze-dried peppers rehydrating. These are all gonna be pizza toppings here. So 
Just need to get those nice and wet and rehydrated before we bake. I sliced up some olives for the children. We have canned just various okra, peppers, pickles, sorts, all sorts of things like that that we like to use as toppings. I can these specifically for this purpose and we get a jar out every time we make pizza. I also have pickled garlic scapes that we'll chop up and the children like to have that on their pizza. We have some anchovies um, that about three of my kids like anchovies. And then this is salami that I bought back in December to make pizza with. It's a was a big thing of salami from um, Sam's Club and we only used half of it. So we still have some left in the fridge to be able to use for pizza through the month of January, which is really nice. What I do is I take a little ball of the dough and I roll it out into kind of a small personal size pizza. And then we just start adding toppings. Each child will let me know what toppings they want. This was for my oldest son, Gabriel. He said he wanted a little bit of everything. <laughs> so we just <clears throat> piled it in on his little pizza here. And then what I'll do is fold that in half and just press the edges down. And this will be his own personal little, I don't know what we want to call it, a calzone or a pizza pocket, something like that. And then so I know whose it is, I have to stamp their name in the top of it so that I can tell them apart from the outside because every child has different preferences. So I know that this is Gabe's. I wrote Gabe in the top and then I'll continue just calling children into the kitchen and having them tell me what toppings they want. And then when we're all done, everybody has their own little pizza pocket that's labeled. We can get these in the oven and bake them on 350 for about 15 to 20 minutes. And there we go. This is always fun. The children love having labeled food for some reason that's personalized just for them. And it's a lot uh, more fun than making just a regular pizza. So every once in a while, I switch it up. And this is what we do. There's Benji's little pizza pocket, what it looks like from the inside. I have to cut it in half to cool it down for him. And he can just pick that up and eat it like you would a sandwich. This is what the, the children do. And um, if you like dipping sauces, you could also make like a marinara dipping sauce for them to dip it in. Or if you're someone who can have, you know, ranch dressing, something like that. Just a fun little meal for the children. And everybody enjoyed their personalized calzone. Now it is time to start thinking about dinner. Once again, the roast had been in the crock pot all day. It has that corn relish on top. I also made some mashed potatoes with the bacon grease in it like I made last week. We grabbed a quart of canned beets and warmed that up and also canned sweet peas. And this is just a simple dinner since the meat was already cooked for me. This was an easy one that roast shredded up really nicely and then it left behind just a beautiful broth all of these drippings and then the relish and as always none of that will be wasted we are going to get all of that in a jar and we'll store the jar in the fridge and then the next time i want to make some rice or a soup or something like that that will be some great flavor to add to another meal and we got that all plated up and this is what that dinner looked like. Lots of good nutrition for the children. And it was a super easy meal. I love my crock pot. I haven't gotten on board with the Instant Pot yet, but I do love <laughs> my crock pot. Everybody says I'll love the Instant Pot one day. Um, I just haven't jumped on board yet. There's what that broth and the drippings looked like. We'll get that in the fridge. And that'll keep for another couple of weeks. Now on this evening, I've decided to take some butternut squash powder. This is butternut squash that we freeze dried and powdered up. And then I've just had it storing on the pantry shelves in a powder form like this. We're gonna rehydrate it and turn it into squash puree so that I can make pumpkin muffins for breakfast the next day. And it's really simple. I don't have an exact ratio for how I add liquids to my freeze dried foods. I just sort of add water until it feels right. As you can see, this needs a whole lot more water <laughs> to be fully rehydrated. So we just keep adding until it gets to a good texture. And then I keep this in the fridge overnight and then it'll be ready the next morning for whatever I wanna bake. On this day, that just so happens to be pumpkin muffins. So there's our puree. 
here is my pumpkin muffin recipe. It makes two dozen full-size muffins, but we are gonna make mini muffins on this day because I'm out of full-size uh, muffin liners. And just to save myself time, <laughs> I'm going to use the mini muffin liners that we have. I know that you can make muffins without using liners by just greasing the muffin dish, but I was feeling kind of um, lazy on this day. So with our muffins, we're going to make some marshmallow fluff. I take one bowl or one cup of warm water and three tablespoons of gelatin. We use pastured beef gelatin. I get it from Azure Standard in bulk. And we're just gonna mix that together so that it is thoroughly mixed. You don't want any clumps of gelatin. And you also want it to kind of start to bloom where the gelatin starts absorbing the water and starts fluffing up. Once that feels pretty thoroughly mixed, then we'll take that gelatin mixture and add it to whatever mixer we're going to make our marshmallow fluff in. I'm gonna use my Bosch mixer on this day and I have the whisk attachment on. I make my marshmallow fluff using either honey or maple syrup. On this day, we're gonna use our homegrown honey. This is some that's left over from 2021 that needs to be used. And we're just gonna add a cup of this to our mixer here while it's mixing up. And I'm just gonna kinda eyeball it. It's not an exact science. Just add approximately a cup and you can mix it up. You could do half honey and half maple syrup. Um, you could use corn syrup, any kind of liquid sweetener that you would wanna use to make your um, marshmallow fluff. And it can take up to maybe 10 minutes for it to fully fluff up. So be patient. And eventually, once it starts getting fluffy, I add a little bit of vanilla extract. You could also do peppermint extract. That's really yummy for like a mint flavored marshmallow. And then when we're all done, we have a beautiful marshmallow fluff and we're gonna make some hot cocoa for this to go in. I don't have an exact cocoa recipe. I kind of wing it every time. So I just pour in, we use cashew milk or almond milk and I just add a little bit of sugar and a little bit of cacao powder. You could use cocoa powder too. Sometimes I leave the sugar out if it's something that I'm gonna be eating because, or drinking because the marshmallow fluff is sweet enough, but um, for the children, I typically add a little bit of sugar. And then we just put it on the stove and kind of warm it up. That um, powder, the cocoa powder, will eventually kind of melt into the liquid and you'll end up with hot cocoa. I just use a whisk and continually kind of whisk it around to get that cocoa to melt and mix around. And then when we're all done, we ended up with all of these mini muffins. I think it was like eight dozen of them. And then everybody had a cup of cocoa and marshmallow fluff. And honestly, that cocoa and marshmallow fluff isn't bad for them. If I bought store-bought cocoa and fluff, it might not be the healthiest food, but really it's just lots of magnesium in the cacao powder. There's gelatin in the marshmallows. It's homegrown raw honey and there are beneficial properties in that. So I don't feel bad at all about giving them this sweet treat for breakfast with the um, beta carotene and all the yummy nutrients in the pumpkin muffins. This really is a nice balanced um, breakfast despite how it looks. For lunch on this day, Gabriel was in charge. He blessed me by handling lunch because I was busy with the baby and little kids and he decided to make tuna salad. We just use homemade mayonnaise, tuna. We have home canned sweet relish and I think he added a little bit of home canned garlic scapes because we had them left over from the day before. He also sliced up our storage apples, and we also have carrots in storage as well, and he sliced some of those up, serving it with some crackers, just a really simple lunch on this day, and um, who says you can't have raw produce on a pantry challenge? You know, we haven't been to the grocery store in over a month. We're still eating raw produce thanks to um, the foresight to store it away back in the fall. So, all right, time for dinner and I pulled out a couple ham steaks to thaw earlier in the day. These are, what does it say? Pork center 
center steaks, fresh ham center steaks. I don't know. It's like a whole ham that they slice into steak size. We have leftover carrots there. I have an onion from storage. These are um, frozen pureed garlic scapes with olive oil that really need to be used up. They're from earlier in the year, and there's some ice accumulating in that container because it's not um, full. So we're going to use all those up on this day. We have frozen kale stems from the garden last year. We have a pint of canned sweet corn. And then this was some freeze-dried Swiss chard that I just added some water to the jar. I'm shaking it up to rehydrate. We'll drain that water and we will add that chard to it as well. And we're just going to make like a stir fry out of all of this to see what we can come up with here. And I cooked up a little bit of rice. This is what everything looked like. We added a little bit of salt. Um, the olive oil from the garlic scape is what helped add a little fat to that. We've got um, coconut aminos and soy sauce that people can eat with it. And it's just a simple stir fry here. Nothing fancy. It's another one of those meals that <laughs> it's not too exciting, but it used up some of the food that we had in storage and it just gets the job done and it didn't taste terrible. The kids liked it. All right, another breakfast. So on this day, I'm taking my apple crisp recipe. All of these ingredients on the top can be replaced with pie filling. So we have a pear pie filling, peach, and also an apple pie filling from last year. So once again, we, we don't need to worry about the top. All we're going to do here is I'm going to triple this bottom part of the recipe. It has a mixture of oats and flour and a little bit of fat. And then we're just going to make like a crumble that we're gonna put over the top of these. I put one pie filling in each of my pie plates here. And then as I mentioned, I tripled the topping. We're just gonna sprinkle this over the top. And this will just be kind of like a sweet baked oatmeal kind of thing <laughs> that we're going to have. And so there's choices. We have three of them so that the children can choose which flavor they want. I'm just gonna bake it in the oven on 350 degrees until they get browned a little bit and bubbly and this is what it looked like. I know you guys say my baked goods are never browned. Um, the lighting makes everything look lighter on my camera. It's just a setting that I can't change on my phone. So anyways, you can see the light change when I move away and it looks a little darker. So the um, I think it baked for probably 40 minutes and this is what everything looked like. We have one child here that wanted pear. <laughs> I think all three of these little boys wanted a different kind. There's what the peach looked like, the child that wanted the peach crisp, and then we'll get some apple to another guy here. And then um, everybody came in from chores and just selected what they wanted. Most of the children were able to have a little bit of each kind. And that made everybody very happy. They ate all three of those um, dishes completely up, so... Definitely some hungry kiddos in the morning. Now it's time to move on to lunch. I have two spaghetti squash left from last fall, and today is the day <laughs> to cook them up for lunch. So I'm just going to wash the outside of the squash and cut them in half and pull out the guts. You can see the inside of this squash, the seeds have already started, started sprouting inside of the squash. Isn't that amazing? Um, it's still safe and wonderful to eat. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the squash. What we're going to do is pull out the guts, the seeds, and all these sprouts, and we'll feed them to the chickens. The seeds are a great dewormer for the animals. And then we put a little bit of olive oil on the cut side, put it cut side down, and we have those base uh, roasting in the oven. Meanwhile, I've got a pound of homegrown ground beef. We've got a jar of our tomato sauce here. We're just gonna mix that together. And we're gonna have a little bit of spaghetti squash with meat sauce for lunch on this day. Once these were fully roasted, we can flip them over and then we'll start shredding them up to get that spaghetti squash uh, meat kind of out of there. All I do is I take a spoon and scrape the inside. You can see all those little strands kind of come out of there. And then we save the peels and anything that's left over, and that goes to the chickens. This is what that looked like. And I love spaghetti squash. Now, there are some 
little boys who sometimes do not like what is served. You can see in John's face here, he was not excited about having squash on this day. So let me tell you how that works because it's a really common question I get about how do I handle children who don't want to eat what I serve. So my rule is that the child needs to at least taste it and take a considerable, like a regular size scoop of the food and eat it to try it. And sometimes they don't want to do that on their own. So I need to fill the fork for them. Sometimes I even need to feed them in order to get it in their mouth. Um, but nine times out of 10, once they actually try the food, they realize it does taste good and they do want to eat it. It's just getting over the visual barrier of eating something that they're not used to. And if you look at John, once he actually tried it, now he's feeding himself and he ended up eating the whole bowl and asking for seconds. So just be patient with your kid, get them to at least try it. And nine times out of 10, they'll try it and they'll, they'll want to eat it. If for some reason after they try it, they don't want to eat more, that's fine. They don't have to eat it, but I do not provide another option. If they're hungry, they will eat it. And if they're not hungry, they'll just skip it and they get the next meal or snack or whatever is offered. And that's no big deal here in our house. But that's how I handle picky eaters. And it works pretty well for me because it's a rare day where I have a child who really won't um, eat what they're served. And they eat a pretty um, balanced diet. They eat a lot of different kinds of vegetables and meats. I'm pretty proud of that. All right. The night before I had pulled these, this was a dozen egg whites out of the freezer. These were left over from when we had made salt cured egg yolks last year. I've done a video all on that, but the whites are frozen and a dozen egg whites is the perfect amount to make something like an angel food cake. So we've also got almond extract, we've got a little bit of vanilla extract. I could not find my cream of tartar. And so I'd read that you can use lemon juice as a one-to-one -one ratio in place of cream of tartar to make a an angel food cake. So we are gonna try that on this day. And um, of course we've got the egg whites, we've got some salt, and David is using the um, angel food cake recipe from Hope's Table. I'm going to link her um, cookbook in the description for you. and. We did find, though, that the egg whites were not whipping up into peaks without the cream of tartar. So I was on a mission. I'm like, I know I have some somewhere in the kitchen. It's not something we use very often. And so I was like, maybe if I just look a little harder, I'll find it because we needed to save it. And eventually I did find it. There's my cream of tartar. <laughs> so we went ahead and added that to the uh, mixture that was in there and it did end up fluffing up once we added the cream of tartar, but it wasn't as fluffy as it normally would. And that's okay. David still made a beautiful cake. It was just a little more dense, somewhere between maybe an angel food and a pound cake texture, but everybody loved it and ate it up. For dinner on this day, I grabbed a package of our homegrown chicken breasts. This was from a batch we did last October. So we are going to bake some chicken and make a bunch of side dishes to go with that and the cake that he had made. So one of my favorite ways to season my chicken is with this Italian dressing seasoning. It's really meant to make salad dressing. I buy it in bulk from Azure Standard, but I also find it's a great way to season meat. So I just sprinkle that over the top, baked the chicken. We had some frozen corn on the cob that we went ahead and boiled up, some canned greens that I heated. And then once again, still working through that lemon juice, there is David's cake. It turned out beautifully. And so we've got lemonade, cake, and all of this yummy food to have for dinner on this day. So that um, corn was just blanched and frozen. And it's been such a treat. It kind of has a little bit of a taste of summer having the corn on the cob in storage. We've really been enjoying that. There's daddy with his little girl. Always enjoy having Adam home <laughs> for dinner. Okay, the night before, I am getting out some freeze-dried zucchini. This is what it looks like. I freeze-dry it just in the slices like this. And what I want to do is make zucchini bread the next, next day. So what I'm doing is just taking those slices and kind of crumbling them up so that once it's rehydrated, it will resemble the texture of like shreds. 
If you took a raw zucchini and shredded it up, that's what I'm hoping just crumbling these like this will sort of resemble. And so there we go. I'm just breaking up any of the larger pieces and then adding some water to it. And then just like we did with the um, squash powder, we will let this sit overnight in the fridge to fully rehydrate and then it'll be ready in the morning to bake our zucchini bread. I just needed two cups of zucchini um, for my recipe and so that quart jar, um, it took me two quart jars of freeze dried zucchini in, or in order to gain that two cups for my recipe. Speaking of my recipe, we're going to work on that. So this is what it looked like coming out of the fridge in the morning. It was rather thick. I added a little extra liquid. Here is my recipe for zucchini bread. And we've just got all of our dry ingredients here in the bowl. Added all of our wet ingredients. As I mentioned, I added just a little bit of extra liquid because the freeze-dried zucchini was kind of dense and needed a little extra. We ended up making two loaves of zucchini bread on this morning. So I just have my greased loaf pans and then we'll get that baking while we go about our chores. This is what that looked like. Just a simple zucchini bread with freeze dried zucchini. This morning we were kind of rushing around because it was our homeschool co-op day. Once we had breakfast served and eaten, it was time to head out and go see all of our homeschool friends and we go to a church gym and play. And when we got back at 1245, I was I needed to make lunch very quickly. So I just grabbed some jars of home canned vegetable soup. We heated it up. Our friend at Homeschool Co-op had given us some of these plantain chips. She had bought a bunch of bags and didn't really like them. So she wondered if we would want to try them. And I said, sure, we'll try a bag. So she sent those home with us. The kids were snacking on them while they waited on me to warm up their suit because they were very hungry after playing at the gym with their friends all morning. And this is what that soup looks like. Just basic vegetables with homegrown tomato juice and there's that. All right, time to make dinner, and I am exhausted on this day. It was a long morning, just very busy, so I'm just throwing together some kind of Mexican casserole, something easy. So we have meat and rice. I have this beautiful new baking dish that my friends, the Landriths, had given me. Um, it's a little larger, and so we're going to try our casserole in this on this evening. I have the last bag of corn tortillas that we have in storage. After this, we are making our tortillas. I'll probably show that in one of the uh, videos in the coming weeks here, how I make my tortillas. But while we have these, we're going to use them up. I also have a jar of our refried beans, a jar of sweet corn. This is just some random salsa that's been in the back of the fridge that needs to be used up. And then we have our taco sauce. And so between that and the meat and the rice, we are just going to layer everything up into kind of like a Mexican lasagna, some kind of like taco lasagna, I guess I'm going to call this. So I don't use recipes all the time, especially during a pantry challenge. Sometimes you just have a bunch of ingredients and you're going to whip it into something. And so that's what we're doing on this day. This used up some salsa that needed used up in the fridge. It used up some taco sauce and the last of these corn tortillas before they went bad. And you just kind of know that these flavors are gonna work together. It's the same things that we would eat if we were going to make soft tacos, but it just was easier because I could put it all in the oven and just kind of let it um, bake for me while I did something else and rested on this day. So wasn't the prettiest meal as it is with a lot of my meals, but you can see those layers of beans, rice, meat. We poured the taco sauce on top. You know what? It got the job done and it really did taste pretty good. This entire casserole pan was gone by the end of the night, so it couldn't have been that bad. <laughs> um, we just baked it on about 350 and then we plated it up. So a lot of times, you know, People will say, you need to focus more on making your food look more appealing. And I find that hungry children will eat it if they are hungry, no matter how it looks. I'm more focused on filling bellies than I am trying to make something look magazine worthy or whatever. As long as it tastes good, that's what mattered. And the kids ate it up on that day.
ending the week with a lot of empty jars. Look at, this is just basically the quart jars that we emptied. So I need to get busy in the kitchen canning protein and that's the goal for next week. Okay friends, and that was it for this week. We were able to get through quite a few um, jars of canned food. They're starting to collect on the countertops. And as I mentioned already in this video, we're really working on canning some shelf stable proteins up as the jars of produce empty. The best thing to do with those jars, instead of just letting empty jars sit in storage, we go ahead and we fill them with dried beans. We fill them with broth or meat and put the jars back on the pantry shelves. And that just helps us cycle through and get things out of the freezer because when protein is sitting in the freezer, it's definitely vulnerable, not only to freezer burn, but we're just one power outage away from losing that food. And so it's much more secure if you can get it canned up sitting on the shelf. It's also more convenient that way because now it's cooked and all I have to do is open a jar and heat it up and we have a meal ready to go. So that's what I'm really focusing on here in these coming weeks as those jars empty. My other goal, and I really do like to set small goals each week during this challenge, my other goal is to really focus on working through the whole grains that we have stored up in our pantry. Um, we do have a grain mill, and I showed you how we're milling down things like buckwheat groats or whole corn or even wheat berries and things to make flour, and that's really important for me to do. I sometimes just tend to default, default to using our pre-ground flowers that we have or going to the store and buying pre-ground flowers even though I have those whole grains sitting in storage and it's mostly just out of laziness and convenience um, but I have no excuse and I can't go to the store right now to go buy those pre-ground flowers so now we will be cycling through those grains and it forces me to get a little more creative in my cooking and to pull out some recipes that I don't necessarily always make it's great for me because I am gluten-free. It's an option for me to learn how to bake with some gluten-free flours like uh, buckwheat flour and things like that. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That's another goal for next week is just to continue working through those grains. So let me know in the comments what your goals are for the challenge here in the coming week. And make sure, as always, to check out the hashtag Three Rivers Challenge and you can see everybody else on YouTube that is participating in this pantry challenge with me. It's so wonderful to have this community and to see how other people are creatively working through the things that they have in their own pantry. So I hope you're enjoying that. And all right, guys, um, until next week, I will see you later, friends. Bye.